Welcome to Working Class Hollywood, conversations with people that make the movies, TV shows, and entertainment you love. If you're looking to break into or move up in the entertainment industry, or you're just a fan of content and want to hear about how it's made, this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Jeremiah Smith. We've all been there. We've all sat in a movie theater and witnessed some sort of magic that moved us to th- see the world differently or ins- inspire us to do something or think about something in a different way. And when you can really dial that into a sound mix, that's special. That's when you know, okay, this has the ability to affect someone. My guest today is Rick Schnupp. Rick is a supervising sound editor and re-recording mixer with the Soundtrack Group in New York City. Rick has worked on way too many TV shows and movies for me to name, but one of his bigger, more recent credits is Free Solo, the documentary that won the Academy Award just this past year. Rick has done every job in the sound industry, starting out as an intern, going into ADR, and then Foley, then editing and mixing, And probably the most exciting thing about my interview with Rick is that he finally explained the difference to me between what it means to be a sound editor versus a sound mixer. So when you watch the Oscars and they have those two sound categories for mixing and editing, I never knew what the difference was, but now I do, thanks to Rick. Rick is a super smart guy. He's very nice. He gives some great advice to anyone that's interested in working in the sound side of the industry. So I hope you enjoy my interview with Rick Schnupp. All right, I am here with Rick Schnupp, supervising sound editor and re-recording mixer. Rick, thank you so much for You're talking welcome. to me. Uh, thank you. It's and good where, to be here. where, where are we? Uh, we're so this is uh, we're skyping, and this is actually my first uh, Skype interview for for this podcast. Um, so hopefully, it comes together nicely. So where where are you located? Where am I skyping you from? Uh, Soundtrack New York in New York City. Soundtrack New York. Oh, is that the name of the company? Yeah, yeah, that's the studio that I work for. For a second, I thought it was just like cool that you lived in a town called Soundtrack and happened to work in audio. <laughs> <laughs> we all should, all the audio guys should get together and start their own town. It would be really sweet. <laughs> so, so uh, I got in touch with Rick because uh, we, a, a girl that I work with, Taryn Vanesta, you and Taryn went to college together. Is that right? Yeah, Emerson College in Boston. Emerson in Boston. Cool. Well, that leads me uh, nicely into my always first question I ask everybody. So where are you from and how did you get into, uh, I guess not Los Angeles, how did you end up in New York? Like what was your journey? Yeah. Um, Yeah, it's kind of a crazy journey. Um, I was born in Pittsburgh, PA. Um, My wife is from Pittsburgh. Oh, really? Yeah. We go back and visit all the time. (laughs) Um, and, um, I uh, went to high school in Morristown in Jersey. <clears throat> um, and in my high school, there was a radio station. Um, and I kind of just wandered in one day and said, what does the board do? And what does the tape machine do? And learned all that. Um, and then I went to Emerson because, uh, Emerson has a big radio program, so it, it kind of felt like that was the right next step if I wanted to keep going in radio. So that was your main interest at the time. You were you were into radio. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, like talk radio then, or like disc jockey? Like what was your what, what were what Well, was your it was a little bit of it was a little bit of everything. I I learned how to mix and um do bumpers and promos and sweepers, you know, all that flashy stuff that you hear um, in, in between songs. So that was probably my, my main interest. Gotcha. Um, and then I kind of realized at some point during college that I was only in radio because I liked music and I got into engineering and mixing music. And, uh, we had a fantastic live mix program at the radio station. Um, bands would come in and play for, I think a half an hour and you had to mic them up and mix them live during their little mini show yeah. and make them sound good, you know? So that was a kind of like a learn on the, on the fly firestorm of, you know, knowledge <laughs> for each band that came in. Nice. Um, and from there, um, I kind of started to get into film mixing and I went to one of my, 
professors and I said, um, I feel like I should go to New York if I want to do this for a, for a living. And he said, well, I happen to know somebody who owns a studio in New York. You should give him a call. So I called and I emailed and I called and I emailed and didn't get anything back. And I think it was probably a month or, or two that I've been trying to reach out to John. He's one of the owners here. And so I just put on my suit and got on the Chinatown bus, $15, came down to New York, walked in and asked for him. I went right up to the front desk and I said, is, is, is John here? And he was standing right behind me. <laughs> so I... I turned around and he said, so how do I know you in this kind of like, you know, who are you to walk in here kind of way? Um, and we sat down and chatted for a half an hour. And at the end of that, I had an unpaid internship. Um, and that was that was the summer before my senior year of college. So I interned here that summer, went back to college, but Soundtrack had a studio in Boston also. So I went back to college but continued interning at Soundtrack Boston for my senior year. And then when I graduated, I came back to New York City. And I've just been kind of working my way up through the ranks here. Nice. That was 12, 12 years ago. Wow, nice. So why did, you, why did you target New York versus L.A.? Just as far as, you know, I think L.A. obviously has more, more production going on and more of an industry. New York has one, obviously, but like why, for you, why was it New York? I had always been thinking about New York or L.A., New York or L.A., and L.A. just seemed to me in college like this distant, far-off kind of world of craziness that I knew nothing about, yeah. you know? I had at least been, you know, in New York a lot when I was in high school, so I kind of understood New York a little bit, and it's close enough to Pittsburgh, you know? It's not on the other side of the country. Yeah. So... I was close to family and I kind of knew it. So I just kind of ended up going, uh, just coming here. Awesome. And I got to say, I love the balls that you had to just like put on your suit and like walk down <laughs> into the building. Honestly, I haven't heard a lot of stories like that. It's like always like emails or calls or direct message on Instagram, but you did it the like the old fashioned way, just like <laughs> knocked on the door, hounded the receptionist. That's I, kudos to you about that. I really <laughs> like that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that comes from being born and raised in Pittsburgh, I think. It's just like... There's <laughs> an old school way of going about things. Right. Also, just like that you're like, you know, you just assume that everyone's nice enough that they wouldn't like kick you out on your ass because exactly. like, no, Pittsburgh totally. people are so nice. <laughs> Everyone there is so nice. <laughs> That's very true. That's very true. <laughs> That's awesome. So so what is the so what is the company that you work for, Soundtrack? So what do they do exactly? Soundtrack is a full-service audio post company. Um, we have uh, mainly sound studios, but Soundtrack also owns a color company, so we do finishing. Um, and uh, it's kind of it's like a, just a, a one-stop a one shop for sound and color. Gotcha. Um, and, but mostly sound. The color company is, is up in Boston and the sound is kind of everywhere. Gotcha. Um, so TV, and, TV um, shows, uh, TV, movies, film. bands, anything, just anyone that wants to record audio. Totally. You guys do it. Totally. They've kind of been, a, I guess like a, a changing, shifting company in the New York scene for many years. Um, soundtrack started just doing music live. Uh, library work, um, just licensing songs. And then they grew into being a jingle house and a music studio. And then when the scene started to change away from music and towards film, um, they incorporated ADR and Foley and film mixing and TV mixing, and it kind of ballooned out from there. Now I would say the majority of what we do here at Soundtrack is film and TV mixing, ADR, Foley, um, and then music projects still happen, but they're kind of few and far be between, really. Gotcha. So when you started there, you were just you were right out of college, but you'd been interning for the company for like a year or so. Uh, so what was what was your first job? Like, what did they put you to work doing? Sure. When I got hired out of school, I was the the night manager. That was my very first job. <laughs> um, you uh, you come in and you just kind of run the place at night um, if sessions call you work with the day booker to book them um and uh clean up at night you know that's part of it too 
Um, it was kind of me. It was me and another intern, and the two of us were kind of running the show from like six thirty or seven o'clock on. Gotcha. Um, and uh, we would just touch base with whoever our manager was to say, "Hey, this uh, you know this artist wants to come in and work the whole night. Can we book that? Uh, you know, or somebody wants to book an ADR session for the next day. How do you want to handle it? Just that, just that kind of stuff. Nice." Uh, and at that point, were you like targeting sound as a career? You're like, was it like just the job you got out of college or were you like, this is my, this is going to be my life's work? Well, I kind of didn't know anything else. <laughs> yeah. So it was sort of like, well, you know, let's give this a, a, a go. You know, I think everybody in sound, if you start working in a company, you start doing the not glorious tasks first, you know, um, that's just studio life. Yeah. If you're in a music studio or a post studio, you kind of start out painting the walls. And then from there you kind of prove yourself a little bit. You go through your paying your dues, quote unquote, and then you kind of start getting gigs. Right. You know, as people get busy and you're the new guy and they say, well, we'll trust you to do this voiceover session or we'll trust you to do this ADR session or so what was the first thing they trusted you to do? Do you remember? Um, oh, man. Gosh, I don't, I don't even know. It was probably a voiceover session. We do a lot of voiceover sessions for ads, mm -hmm. like uh, spots for Subway and um, Dunkin' Donuts and that kind of stuff. So I'm sure it was one of those. Um, but I'd been engineering music here for, for a long time. Uh, you know, when I was the night manager, there were plenty of nights where artists would call us up saying, hey – can we come in and mix? And then I was the only one there. So who's doing the session? Yeah. Me. <laughs> Got it. So you, you were still um, so getting your hands on those. the equipment and, and, you know, totally, working the yeah. board and stuff. Yeah. Awesome. So totally. when did you like make the shift from like, you know, the night manager booking sessions and stuff to like, you know, what, what was your next step inside the company? I was a night manager for two and a half years. And then, um, people, you know, as happens, look for greener pastures and they move on to other stuff and bigger and better things. And a position opened up with one of our ADR mixers as his second. Mm -hmm. And I started working with, with him doing ADR. And that was kind of, and I had done a fair amount of ADR before working with him because, you know, say you're the night manager, you're working the whole week long um, doing that. But occasionally, you know, they may need somebody to cover an ADR session one afternoon, you know, so I'd, I had certainly done a lot of ADR leading up to that point. Um, but when I started to work with him, uh, with Mark, um, that was pretty much all day, every day ADR for the next couple of years. Nice. And can you just explain what ADR means for anyone that's listening that doesn't know what that is? Totally. Um, ADR is called Automated Dialogue Re replacement um and uh basically once a film or tv show has been shot um there are certain lines that maybe weren't re recorded very well because of the environment it could have been raining they could have been on a beach um and so the actor needs to come back into the into the studio to redo that that dialogue but it could also be used to add in dialogue that wasn't shot um, it could be used to, you know, add in a certain line to make the scene make better sense. It could be used to change facts. I've certainly done ADR for that. If, you know, they shoot the show and they realize, well, in the 1800s, we said something cost this amount of money, but actually it cost this amount of money. So, you know, the fact checkers caught it. So we have to change it. Um, so it can be done for really any number of reasons. And what, how many days of ADR typically would like, you know, an hour long TV show do or, or a big movie do? Well, it kind of depends on, it depends on a lot of things. It, it depends on whether the director and the pro and the producers are really open to ADR and want to do it. There's a lot of films that I've done now as a sound supervisor that I've gone in and they've said, we're not doing any ADR, but then some people love it and some people want to make the performances better. Um, so, you know, the, the film that I just finished had, um, I think 200 to 300 lines, um, which is about three ish weeks worth of ADR. Oh, wow. Um, which can be pretty heavy. That's, that's on the heavier side. 
Um, but there's other things that I've done that'll be, you know, a hundred lines or 50 lines. Yeah. Um, a lot of the television shows, if it's like an HBO show, premium cable, they, they tend to put a little more budget into the ADR category. So that can be, you know, as many as 50, 60 lines. Nice. Now, so what are you, what are you actually doing during these ADR sessions? Like what's your, what's your job? from kind of beginning to end. Um, so when I was working with, with Mark, I was the pro tools operator and to any sound person, they know pro tools is, you know, that's what, that's your operating system. Yes. That's that's what your, that's your actual, um, DAW, your DAW. Um, so you start off by importing, you know, the quick time picture and the audio guides from the, um, production, and they also send you cue sheets and you take the cue sheets and the cue sheets have all the actors lines and you program those cues into pro tools, test them out. You make sure everything's working. Um, and then the session starts. And while the session's running, my job is really to manage all the takes that the actor or actress does. So, you know, if they do five or six takes, I, I have them all listed there. And when somebody says, I, I want to hear take five, I cut that in, kind of sync it up a little bit so Mark can play it back and everybody can hear that that take. Nice. And it's a it's a big editing job because, you know, somebody could go through and rattle off wild lines. They could go through and you know, without stopping, they could do five or six takes just in a row. And you have to kind of manage that when they say, Okay, I want to hear the first, third, and fourth. You've got to kind of move quickly <laughs> yeah and so is that, more of a speed job is the actor else. there watch like in just like a vocal booth like watching playback of the film and just like speaking as they you know as their line comes up in the movie is that kind of how it works totally yeah we basically what we do is um we have a, a cue beeps system where um the actor or actress sits there with their um with their copy and they're watching the film go, and we have synchronized cue beeps right prior to the line. So you'll hear beep, 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 and then the line starts. So that's kind of our cueing process to get them in. Gotcha. So you were you were this guy's second or his assistant for like two years? Two and a half years. I've maybe been closer to three. I'm a little hazy there. Yeah. But, uh. <laughs> uh, and then and then what happened after that? Um, well, the you know kind of the same thing that always happens. Someone else leaves, and then you kind of start looking into other stuff that you can do to keep yourself busy. Um, and uh, all of it is kind of fluid. You know, it's not it's not a rigid sort of you're doing this job and only this job and then this job and only that job. There's a lot of um, flu fluidity to work in here. Okay. If that makes any sense. You wear a lot of hats. Um, exactly. Um, and kind of while I was trans transitioning out of ADR, I was doing a lot of Foley and Foley was lots of fun. Very, very different, totally different vibe. Um, uh, Foley is um, basically you're shooting the sound of the actor or actresses, their their um, uh, cloth movements and footsteps and any cups, chairs, um, little sounds that they would interact with. Um, and we would do, you know, a couple days per episode. You know, I did a couple seasons of Royal Pains. So we would do the first day for an episode of Royal Pains would be just footsteps. The second day would be just props. Um, and then we would do films too. And for a film, you would have hopefully a full week, but sometimes it was only like three or four days. And we would do it the same way. We would start off just doing footsteps for a couple of days and then props for a couple of days. Were you, so you're watching the movie and you're like just stepping your feet like in time with like the actor's feet. Like, so does that mean you like, have a bunch of different types of shoes in the in the sound stage. Like, are you? There's a whole lot of shoes. Yeah. Are you tra are you traipsing <laughs> around in high heels to like get the footsteps <laughs> of the women too? The foley artist is. I'm the engineer. Ah, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> so there's someone that there that's actually making the sounds. You were there, they're just recording the sounds. Totally, totally. Yeah, it's a it's a two man job. Um, I was the foley engineer, foley mixer. Um, and then the, our Foley artists, we've had a number of different Foley artists, um, but the Foley artist I was working with at, at that time, Leslie, um, 
is in the room watching everything. And I'm watching everything too, but I'm in the booth. Um, and I have all the cues, kind of like during ADR where you have a cue sheet. When you're the Foley mixer, you have the same thing. You have a Pro Tool session with cues for all the different sounds that the, that the show needs. And the cues will, will say the character name, what kind of shoe they're wearing, what kind of surface they're walking on. So it could say, you know, Dan in sneakers on snow, you know, or Pete in high heels on concrete, yeah. you know. Um, and so you just call the cue out to your, to your Foley artist. They wrangle everything together and go. And it's very fast paced, um, operation. You can have almost a thousand cues in one episode of television. Wow. Um, and it all depends really. We would, we would always shoot for like 300 to 400 cues in, in one day. Um, so, you know, certain things you kind of fly through like hand moves, if it's like a hand pat on your like cloth movement, that kind of stuff flies. That's pretty quick. Right. Footsteps are pretty quick too. But if it's like, you know, someone knocked over a jar of M&Ms and the lid fell on a chair and the chair moved and then it rolled on the floor, you know, it's like all that stuff gets very complicated and that, that takes a little bit more time and patience. Yeah. (laughs) God, it's so crazy to me that like that, like that just feels like such an old school way of doing things. Like I imagine like, you know, guys in like the thirties with like suits and like, you know, like news, newsboy caps, like running around a stage making sound effects. But like, that's still how we make totally. TV and movies today without suits. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now everyone's just wearing like um, t-shirts and cargo shorts probably. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to worry about dressing up for a fancy actor or actress. So you can wear whatever you want. Um, yeah. It's typically two dudes in a hot, sweaty room. Just making sounds. Just making you know? sounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So uh so you did that for another couple years as the Foley yeah, engineer. Yeah. What are some of the kind movies of and TV shows and you did did uh that for? Can you name because I I, li- I looked you up on IMDb and there's just like so many. Yeah, it, it got a little crazy. Um Royal Pains was the f- the first one. Um and uh I think I filled in a little bit on Quantico, which was another show. Um, There were a lot of films. Um, They were all indies. Um, There's a film called Shelter, Paul, Paul Bettany's first film as a director. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I'd honestly, I'd have to look at IMDb to remember, to remember all the movies that you've, that you've worked on (laughs) that I did fully though, that I did fully for. Um, cause that is also kind of in the rear view mirror. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I would have to look it up. Uh, so, so then, so, so now you've done ADR. Then you're the Foley engineer, but then you you've moved on again, right? Yeah. So what's next? Um, now at this point, you the next step up is kind of focusing on sound editing, um, and sound editing is um, a pretty pretty in, intense job um, in the sound field. It's probably the second most uh after mixing um basically as a sound editor you're focused on one of any fields you're focused on either dialogue or sound effects or foley or adr and the the easy way into doing this was while i was a foley mixer i would start taking on jobs as foley editor because after the two of us have shot all those sounds someone's got to go and sync it up perfectly you know because our sync isn't 100 percent perfect Um, and I started taking on jobs, uh, doing fully editing and dialogue editing, which is kind of how you start. Those are the two easier ones. Um, and then, uh, you know, you don't screw those up and eventually you get offered sound effects editing jobs, which is a much higher area. Um, it's, it's a lot more creative where fully in dialogue is kind of either, I want to, I don't want to say it's not a creative field, but it's sort of right or wrong. Right. You know? It either matches what's on screen or doesn't. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, there's not really too much of a creative edge in it, but, um, but the sound the effects, sound... it's like, do you want the the laser gun to go pew pew or like, choo, choo, like you get to exactly, make decisions. Yeah. You're creating the world really, you know, so that, 
that's uh, a much bigger thing. You can use either of those laser sound effects I just did in one of the movies you're working on. I, <laughs> I, I give you permission, say, that was, yeah. That was, that was pretty good. <laughs> it, was like half, it was like halfway between Star, like Star Trek and Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> will, will, you, will you explain something to me really quickly? Uh, so anyone that's ever watched the Oscars knows that there's two main uh, sound categories. There's best sound mixing and best sound editing. What the hell is the difference? I've never really quite understood what the difference between editing and mixing is. The sound editors bring all the in- ingredients to the table and the sound mixer mixes them. Gotcha. So editing is like placement of within the timeline and matching sound to video and everything. And then the and mix- what the actual sounds are. And what the actual sounds are. And then the mixer is controlling, going through and controlling the levels of all the tracks of audio, making sure that everything's heard and nothing's peaking and blowing out. And is that, is that right? Did I get it right? Totally. Oh, no, that's exactly man, it. I am so much smarter after having talked talk to you. <laughs> so yeah. The sound mixer blends it all. Um, and the one, one of the big differences is when you're a sound editor, again, that's more of an isolating job you're kind of on your own working in a dark room, making sound effects or putting stuff back in sync or cleaning up dialogue. When you're mixing, you're interfacing with the director face, face to, to face and the director saying, no, I don't want that. <laughs> right. Or I want it to be more like this, or this is the vibe, you know, that, you know, that has got to be a warm sounding scene. This has to be a harsh sounding scene. So it's a, it's a totally different side of your brain. Gotcha. So which which one were you doing after the after the Foley? Editing. Editing. Sound editing. So that's that's for the same types of projects though, for TV shows, movies. Totally. All that stuff. Mostly indie films. Yeah. Mostly indie films. Do you guys kind of specialize in indie films? No, we do everything. Um our most famous mixer here, Tom Fleischman, um, does does all of Marty uh, Martin Scor- Scorsese's films. Nice. And um uh, has worked with pretty much everybody, ah. you know, but we have mixers at every level. Gotcha. Um, I saw on your, on your IMDb that you did some work for Avengers age of Ultron, but uncredited. Yes. What does that mean? Yes. <laughs> What's uncredited? Uh, un- uncredited means I did a lot of work and didn't get a screen credit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, what we did for that was, um, ADR. Uh, we had, um, I forget even the character that we had in. It was an animated character. Um, and we had mic'd them up and they had like, you know, a helmet mic and a suit mic and there was a boom mic and a lavalier and everything. And um, the director was there just kind of reading lines with them and they were walking around and it was it was pretty nuts. We did, I think, three, three weeks worth of sessions. Nice. Um, but a lot of things I put in, I don't update it if it's, you know, something that is a smaller project. If it's like a bigger film, then I'll usually put in that I worked on it, even though I know it's going to say that. Right. But, you know, even if I don't get a credit, I'd still rather have it listed. Yeah, you know? of course. Well, I mean, yeah, your IMDb is impressive. So whatever you're doing, you're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So now you're, you're like climbing the ladder here. You're now you're editing. Is there more after that, that you're, you're past that now? Totally. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sound supervisor and mixer um, and still sound editing. You know, you're kind of in this, I'm kind of in this fluid place now where I'm mixing a lot more. Um, I, uh, I work with Tom Fleischman, who I mentioned earlier. Um, he's soundtracks uh, kind of chief mixer here. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, like for, for a free solo, which we were talking about earlier, uh, that was a two-man mix. So in that situation, Tom is mixing dialogue and music. I'm mixing sound effects. Gotcha. Um, and two-man mixing is also sort of an older style of mixing. Um, when you didn't have fader automation, you had to have two two people manning all of the fader moves throughout the whole film. Um, but now it's just a way to get through it faster. <laughs> You know, um, people are forever coming at us with less time and less money. And the only way to combat that really is to just do it faster. Yeah. And a lot of ways, a lot of one of the easiest ways to do that is just to have more people here working. Right. Um, So I've been lucky enough to be learning from Tom now for the past two or three years. It's been 
actually longer than that. It's been about three and a half years um, as his second. Um, and so what that looks like is, um, you know, a film will come in uh, that's mixing with with Tom and my job will be first and foremost to um, get all the editors sessions in uh, from the sound supervisor, whoever that is. They've wrangled up the dialogue session and the Foley session and the sound effects session. And you set all those up through our board. What board do you guys work on? What's like the make and model if I were to Google it? It's a Euphonics System 5. Euphonics um, it's a little System older. 5. Gotcha. We're upgrading to a System 6 later this, this summer. Fun. Um, so uh, basically I set all the sessions up for him. Um, and then if he's mixing the whole thing, then that's it. He's off running and I don't have to worry about much. Um, until something stops working and then I have to fix it. <laughs> um, but then after the mixes are done, that's when the other part of my job will come into play. Um, you know, the producers will reach, reach out to me and say, okay, we got to send files out to the, to, uh, to the quality con- control people. And we got to send an ME out for international and we need a 5.1 and a two track and a seven one and an Atmos mix and all this other stuff. Saying a um, lot of words and, so, and numbers that I don't understand, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it can be a little technical. Um, mixed tech is, I guess, the proper name of of that job. Mixed tech. Gotcha. Um, but the the great part of it is when um, he's open to having a, a second mixer with him, then I can mix with with him. Um, and uh, that's what we did on 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 free free solo and a number of other films. Um, so on free solo, a film called they. E- even though it was a, you know, it's a documentary. Were you guys still doing like Foley and ADR, and or were you just mixing like whatever, uh, you know, whatever tracks they had captured in in the field on that? It was, it was a combination. Um, with documentary, it's always a little bit gray for that reason that you you know you're not really sure if you need to create a lot of stuff. It's certainly not as much heavy lifting as a dramatic feature. Mm-hmm. Um, but for free solo, we did a really cool thing um, with Foley um, during Alex's climbing scenes. There was a lot of Foley that we had done for his hands and his, and his feet. Oh, okay. Um, so there was a lot of Foley work done there. And then just people walking down the sidewalk, you know, and we would do Foley for their walk. Yeah. Well, the opening um, sequence of that movie, like the very first shot is like, like that, drone or jib or whatever it is it comes over the top and like like you you're looking down on him and he's climbing and like the sound for that is is really good and it stood out to me as someone that you know works in the industry i'm like wait is he wearing a microphone as he's climbing or is that was that all like because you hear him like (gasps) breathing you hear his hands like scraping the rocks like was that all you guys did you guys like add that in after the fact well the the breathing was real that was actually him um the rest of it was all added gotcha um, so, you know, that's, again, that's the your sound effects editor there is choosing what kind of wind do we want? Um, do we want it to be a howling wind or a bustling wind or a gusty wind? And, you know, what kind of birds do, do we want? And then me as the mixer, I take the bird sound and I add some nice slap echo or reverb to it to make it sound like it's in the mountains and everything. Mm-hmm. And then the hands and the feet scraping, that's all fully worked too. Wow. So I'm blending that to try and make it what I what what I really wanted to do with free solo was try to make the climbing sounds not sound like it was foley it had to sound real. Right. So that was probably the 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 most of what I did on that mix was just kind of making sure the foley felt real. Nice. Well, I don't know if it's cuz I was like about to interview you knowing that you did the sound for it uh or just because it was so damn good but when I the first scene of that movie like really stood out to me I was like like the sound that I was hearing as he's climbing, like kind of like riveted me. I was like, wow, like it really, like it, it, it really got me. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. That's what we do it for, you know, because that's the whole business of it is he's just climbing without ropes. So it should sound very like, whoa. Yeah. So I'm glad that worked. And then <laughs> it just, the, the process of mixing just kind of like the nuts and bolts of it. So you get, you get a, at this point it's like locked picture, right? So we hope you hope. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you get the it's latched, really. you get it sent over from like the, the editors, the, the, uh, you know, the, the final up version of the film. 
and you get all the like whatever like the the sound is that they recorded on set and then you guys just like open up your pro tool session and like just start from scratch and start like you know everything's there and you're just mixing it and like just playing it back making sure it sounds like you like turn it down turn it up i mean is that the basic job yeah well um i'll break down the sound supervisor job because that's probably the that's the next biggest step prior to to mixing and it's a a big part of what you're talking about happens by the uh, supervisor okay so whenever the job will come in, Soundtrack will choose somebody to be the sound supervisor and somebody to be the, the mixer. And the sound supervisor will put together a whole team of sound editors. That's the person who says, you know, such and such will be my dialogue editor, my effects editor, my Foley editor, etc. cetera. And, and then really the first job of the sound supervisor is to have a spotting session with the director. Um, so we'll take, as you said, the final quick time. We hope it's locked. It may not be. <laughs> um, and we'll watch the film down with the director in real time and we'll take notes and we'll say here, you know, what, what do we want this scene to sound like? We want it to sound like this. We want this kind of car, this kind of bird. We don't want happy summertime birds. We want sad, cold winter birds. You know, <laughs> we don't want, you know, the car looks like this car, but we want it to sound like this car, you know, all those kind of things. Nice. Um, and then after that is when the sound editing job starts. And for an indie film that can be, you know, uh, five to six weeks, um, we try to keep it to five, but if it's a big editing job, it could be six. And during that process, um, the sound supervisor has given their spotting notes to all the sound editors, which is kind of like the direction that they need to take with their editing and checking in on, on everybody listening to how everything sounds and um, playing back things for the director. Um, if there's like a design sequence, like, oh, we want to hear how this monster sounds. The director will come in and listen to that while it's being made and make sure they get the sound that the director wants. Do you do you guys um, do that too? You create sound effects like monsters? Totally. And yeah, that's that would be whoever's doing the sound design design or the sound effects editing will be that person. And what do they um, what, what do they use to make that? Like if I were to say like hey, I want this monster to sound like, you know, like ro like robotic but also like got some like alien but also it's like some dinosaur and like it's just like a, like then like what uh, wh what do you even d use to make that? Like software, Are you like recording things in mics and Yeah, there's a combination of a lot of different things. Um we have a library of sounds here that are are bought from basically various sound libraries as they come out. Um, and uh, we also go out and shoot stuff um, if we think, well, it could, you know, the the hinge on that door has a nice rumble to it. Let's get a recording of that. If I <laughs> slow that down, that could sound like a thing, you know. Um, and there's lots of plugins too um, that you can use to um, bend and contort and twist sounds to have a character that you want. Um, there's a plugin I think called the dehumanizer. Um, I've never personally used it, but I know a lot of editor friends of mine have used it to make like monster alien vocal stuff. Wow. Okay. Um, but I tend to like to work with sounds that are in the libraries that we have and just kind of mess, mess around with pitching them and slowing them down and warping them and, you know, doing all that fun, creative stuff. Nice. Nice. As you're talking about the sound supervisor, it reminds me I interviewed uh, a gal named Jamie Vega Wheeler uh, for this podcast, actually. And she's a post producer uh, for scripted cool. television. She was episode 18, if anyone wants to go back and listen to it. But uh, yeah, so she did a lot of, it sounds similar to like what you're talking about, where she like coordinates all the different recording sessions and you know, goes through it with the director and like, you know, then does like coordinates the, the Foley and this and that and that. So since you guys have cross, you have a crossover. She was more TV though. Um, scripted TV. Um, cool. And so what, um, what's your favorite part about this job? Like what, what do you love about the sound industry? Um, probably, uh, just, you know, when you lock into a director with their vision and you're able to really tell the story in a in a way that they're hearing in their head, and you see an audience react to it and vibe with it. 
that's a really special thing because we've all been there. We've all sat in a movie theater and witnessed some sort of magic that moved us to th- see the world differently or, um, you know, in- inspire us to do something or think about something in a different way. And when you can really dial that into a sound mix, that's special. Yeah. That's when you know, okay, this has the ability to affect someone. Yeah. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, that is cool. And the sound is so, I mean, it's such a big part of that immersive experience. And, I, you know, I think it's something that not a lot of people think about all the time. But they have, like, there's, like, YouTube videos of, like, movies without sound effects or... Uh, you you know what I mean? And you watch it and it's like, it's just like so dry and boring. And it's like, like it really does take like the, the creative hard work of people like yourself to like pull these stories together and like make them so impactful. So that is, is a cool thing. If you know, as you know, especially with horror films, if you just turn the sound off, you're not scared anymore. Yeah. 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 You know, it's like all you see is some flashy, scary pictures and you're not really scary yeah yeah exactly <laughs> you know the, the the way the music hits you and the way that little barely audible sound just scared you you know that stuff is all sound yeah you know awesome uh so what do you recommend uh for people that are interested in this industry aside from you know putting on a suit and driving to new york city and knocking on your door uh what are some ways that people can you know, get involved in this, that can, you know, what are like some entry level jobs? How, how could people get into this sound industry? Um, well, I would say, you know, there's really two different tracks to getting into sound. Um, there's the track that I took, which is work for a company and work your way up, or there's the, just go it on your own track, you know, and both of those have their merits and, Um, I don't think either one is better than the other. They each have their pros and cons. If you're going it on your own, then you kind of want to start at the beginning, which I would say is probably something like Craigslist, you know, look up jobs that, um, that are posted there. There's no, there will never ever be an end of people who want to hire you and not pay you. So start there. (laughs) Working for free. Um, Yeah. uh, Just say yes and learn from it, you know? Um, you get to meet whoever that person is. Maybe they go on and do something that actually has, has a budget or, um, if nothing else you learn, oh, I don't want to do this for a living or I do want to do this for a living and I've learned this. So next time I'll do it better or next time, you know, whatever. Um, if you want to work for a studio, then I would just do the same thing that I did. Just go to places and walk in, you know, don't email them because, God, the number of e- the number of resumes and CVs that come in through email yeah. and just get put in a folder and never read again is just endless. I, I mean, we probably have hundreds at this point. Um, you know, just walk in and say, "Hey, I'm here. I'm looking for an internship. Can I fill something out? Here's my CV. Here's a demo reel. Here's whatever." Um, that impresses people. You know, it's kind of old school and it's kind of funny, but it really makes a difference. It shows that you're willing to do something yeah. as, uh, as opposed to just here, just hire me. You know what I mean? Right. You f- we went through the work to actually show up that shows. Something. Yeah. We just had uh we, we brought this girl on um, who's like, you know, trying to make a transition between industries. She's, she's, she has a career, but she wants to get into production. And so we had, uh, we met her and we hired her on for a couple of days to work with us on on Vanderpump Rules, the show that I work with uh, Taryn on. And first of all, she like crushed it, just like was like so hardworking, just like really did a great job. And then the next day we come into the office and she had FedEx overnighted like these like handwritten thank you cards. And it was like, geez, <laughs> this is like, this is like, like no one ever does that. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, and it, totally. and, and in it, I will say it made an impression because we're like, you know, yeah. we, 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 open them and we're like, you know, impressed by that. And then we were talking about her and, you know, she'll probably get more work from us in the future because she, she figured out a way to make an impression that wasn't just, you know, like a a blind email or whatever. So totally. Yeah. The, the old school stuff works really does. It really does. Uh, 
Cool. Well, what what else is interesting about your job or your your industry? Like, what else can you share? You know, something that maybe people don't know about, or uh, you know, something that would surprise people about sound and film and TV. Nothing happens by accident. Every single sound that you hear is there for a reason. You know, if you're watching something and you hear something, that was that did that car just didn't happen to drive by during that take. You know that. That was, or maybe it did for the picture, but the sound of it was in, intentionally placed there. You know, if you hear something and you think, oh, maybe that was just a little thing here, or that was, you know, um, that was just a stray footstep of this person. No, somebody actually did that. Yeah. <laughs> Every single frame from start to finish is in, intentionally done. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't realize They, you know, because I mean, that's, that's part of what it means to do a good sound mix. The mix is really good when you don't notice, you know, um, if you can just watch the film and fall into this world and be totally, you know, just, just be in this moment and not think about the fact that you're sitting in a dark theater, then I've done our job. You know, we have done our jobs, right. Um, but you know, the moment someone starts to think about, oh, I didn't hear that dialogue or I didn't understand that. Or why does that sound like that? That's what you don't want. <laughs> yeah. I worked, uh, I, when I was a teenager, I worked, uh, well, like I volunteered for this theater, uh, in San Diego and I would work a lot with the, the, uh, I forget whatever his title was, the sound guy for the, the theater you know, and they were running a bunch of, you know, wireless uh, with the actors and the PA system and everything. And his thing that he'd always tell me, he's like, he's like, our job is to make sure no one ever thinks about the sound. Like, it's like, yeah. if it, the exactly. only time people notice sound is when it's bad. So if someone notices the sound, we we messed up. And I thought I, I thought that was interesting. That's exactly it. You know, you don't want people to ever notice it. It just has to be there and it has to be right. And they have to just be in this magical place that they're not thinking about it. That's cool. Well, that's one of the reasons I was excited to interview you because I want, you know, even though they might not notice it in, in the theater as they're watching a the movie or, you know, at home as they're watching a TV show, they should notice people like you and, like, recognize, like, the hard creative work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. Uh, I really appreciate it. I feel like I learned a lot, and I think people are going to, you know, they're going to really enjoy hearing about, about your industry. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, that was my interview with Rick Schnupp. Thank you guys so much for listening. I really do appreciate it. If you haven't yet, please go onto iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to this podcast and subscribe, leave a rating, or write a review. It is very helpful to the podcast. If you want to reach me, you can. I'd love to hear from you. My email address is show, S-H-O-W, at workingclasshollywood.com. Or you can find me on Instagram. It's workingclasshollywood. I am going to go watch the Game of Thrones Season 7 premiere right now. I'm so excited, and I will see you guys next time.